Well, it looks like it's <clears throat> time to begin, and we're, we're still in Romans, but we're getting close to the end of Romans, and uh, we're in chapter 13, and in way of review, let me share this with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember, we're talking about the government and some of the things, you got to remember, when Scripture tells us how to act, a lot of times that goes against our human nature. That's the problem, our human nature. And we see this when here's how we're supposed to be toward our government and people in authority. And sometimes that rubs us the wrong way, but, but we see from what uh, God tells us how necessary it is for those people in authority. <clears throat> Christians understand Romans 13 in different ways. All Christians agree that we are to live at peace with the state as long as the state allows us to live by our religious convictions. For hundreds of years, however, there have been at least three interpretations of how we are to do this. One, some Christians believe that the state is so corrupt that Christians should have as little to do with it as possible. Now, if you do some of the reading of, of the early people in the church, a lot of them felt this way, to have nothing to, to do with the government. That didn't mean they tried over, they just had nothing to do with the government. Although they should be good citizens as long as they can do so without compromising their beliefs. They should not work for the government, vote in elections, or serve in the military. Now, second interpretation. Others believe that God has given the state authority in certain areas and the church authority in others. Christians can be loyal to both and can work for either. They should not, however, confuse the two. In this view, church and state are concerned with two totally different spheres, the spiritual and the physical, and thus complement each other but do not work together. Second view. And a third way to look at it, still others believe that Christians have a responsibility to make the state better. They can do this politically by being by electing Christian or other high principle leaders. They can also do this morally by serving as an influence for good in society. In this view, church and state ideally work together for the good of all. None of these views advocate rebelling against or refusing to obey the government's laws or regulations unless those laws clearly require you to violate the moral standards revealed by God. Wherever we find ourselves, we must be responsible citizens as well as responsible Christians. Probably you can take something out of all three of these things and, and they would work the, the, the best. Now, something that, that you might not be aware of, but I think is important too, when we look at our country and we realize that people came here for religious freedom. And that's a good thing. We have a government. We don't have to worry about uprisings or revolutions. If there's someone that, that is not doing a good job, we can go to the ballot box and vote. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big thing when you think about it. Now, does that mean that corrupt people get in different levels of our government and other places? Yes, they do. But uh, the thing about it is, when we have the opportunity to encourage good people to be in these positions, that's what we, we need to do. <clears throat> now, something you might not be aware of I think this is important too. Did God select places where people would live, set up boundaries? A scripture we're not really that familiar with, but let's look at Acts 17, 
26. And Acts 17, 26 says this, From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He is not far from any of us. See, I, to me, you think about this, we're here because this is where God put us. And again, I think from our roots, we realize that, that the people that were responsible for our nation had the right motives to establish the nation that we did. All right, any, any comments about that? Boy, this year you're gonna pay your taxes and love it, aren't you? <laughs> okay, we don't have to go that far, do we? All right, if we look at a few of these verses here, let me uh, go back and, and read the first uh, seven verses. Let everyone be subject to the government authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of one and authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. So that's it in a nutshell, and that's, that's a tough thing for us. Again, human nature in our picture, that picture, and that's what God helps us to fight against all through the entire Bible, because it's the thing that gets the best of us. And you think, well, what do you mean human nature? Well, just think, greed, things like that. That's usually what gets the best of us. And uh, it's a constant fight against those things. That's just one thing I mentioned. There's many more. In verse 3, it is a comment upon the effectiveness and success of the state as God's ordained institution that such a statement as this stands as truth. Aberrations may be cataloged and failures noted. But in the principal part, and in the overwhelming number of examples afforded by history, Paul's language here must stand as unchallenged truth. There has hardly been a state in history where the private exercise of Christian faith has been the object of governmental hatred and punishment. The glaring exception to this is in the ruthless Marxist governments which have appeared in the last century. And should that type of government gain ascendancy in areas populated by Christians, there could well be another age of martyrs like that which descended upon the first century. Shortly after these noble words were penned, the truth of Paul's words here is not violated, either by the persecutions of the first century or the threat, threat of persecutions now. You know, we find that kind of strange when they say, you know, that, that the government's never really went after Christians, except Marxist states, which, you know, they're atheists completely. And even we've seen that change over the last probably 50 years. They're not quite as adamant against religion as, as they once were. And in verse 4, the word rendered he or the one in this verse could be translated it, 
but the translators are correct in making it personal. For only a person could be spoken of as bearing the sword. The person in view, therefore, is the policeman, the legally constituted arm of human government, making the law enforcement men and women of cities, states, and nations to be everywhere as much ordained of God as any minister of the gospel. You know, think about this. We usually look at the government in big terms, right? But when it comes right down to the way we're most affected by an arm of the government or, or our state or our community, it's the police. If we're in fear of our life and we may be attacked or somebody's causing this problem, who do we call? The policeman. So I think it fits it very well here in Scripture. And if you'll notice, we're getting into areas it's almost like we're reading the paper today. You think about the policeman and, and how uh, they've been, well, they want to get rid of them in places. And we know that makes no sense, and Scripture tells us it makes no sense. You need these people. James Burt, Burton Kaufman, he was a Bible commentator, and he was also a minister of the, the church. He lived to be 101. He wrote commentaries on every book in the Bible. Here's something else. I read an article in the Christian Chronicle, and... Uh, it talked about Lester Holt, Luke's commentator, my brother. He is a brother because he's a member of the church. And his parents and all were members of the church. My, and I think maybe his dad and his grandfather were even an elder. But they'd say he would get done with the news uh, cast there in New York, and then he'd go over to the Manhattan Church of Christ. And this is where uh, Bertrand Kaufman preached for years. But anyway, Here's what he had to say about this particular subject. A gutless namby-pambyism, boy, I'll tell you, getting right down to it, huh? uh, gutless namby-pambyism has come to characterize far too many Christians of this age who naively and stupidly suppose that police departments are dispensable, that love can just take everything and that our own enlightened age does not need the old-fashioned relics of barbarism such as policemen in jail. Let all hear it from the Word of God. If they are so blind as to be unable to read it in history that the policeman also is God's man and that without him there is nothing, the writer once invited two New York policemen into his living room gave them a cup of coffee, and read this chapter to them with the same exposition as here. Their astonishment and gratitude were nearly incredible. One of them reached for the New Testament to read it himself and said, I do not wish that everyone knew this. No, he said, I do wish that everyone knew this. The other spoke up and said, well, it would help a lot if all the clergymen in our city knew it. We say the same. Much of the vilification, harassment, and warring against policemen in the current era has blinded some good people to the absolute indispensability of government authority, including the effectiveness of the police establishment. When do you think he said this? Last year? What if it wasn't? This was 1973 that he said these words. But yet, don't they just come out of the headlines yet today? So when we look at it from God's point of view, we realize why governments exist, why police officers, police, policemen, men and women exist. And we realize there are bad ones. There's no doubt about it. But that's the ones that we need to get rid of because there's so many good ones that do so much good for us. Kaufman went on to say this about capital punishment. It is clearly allowed to be a legitimate prerogative of human government, 
by Paul's statements here, those states which have yielded to the naive do-gooderism of the present era by abolishing the capital penalty will eventually pay the price of their foolishness. Present day lawgivers are not wiser than God who laid down such penalties and enforced them in the Old Testament dispensation. True, the Decalogue says, thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20, 13. But the same God who said thou, that also said, thou shalt surely kill him, Numbers 15, 35. These commandments do not nullify each other because they speak of different things. One translator, Moffat, <clears throat> made the difference here. Thou shalt not do murder, Exodus 20, 13, the sixth commandment of the Ten Commandments. The man must certainly be put to death, Numbers 15, 35. And when we look at this, there's two words here that's being used. They're Hebrew words. One, and I'll just spell it, R-A-T-S-A-C-H, it means murder. And H-A-R-A-G means put to death. Murder, of course, is forbidden. But the imposition of the death penalty by government is not forbidden. Humanity will never find a way to eliminate such a penalty completely because it is the threat of death alone which enables policemen to apprehend and capture perpetrators of crime. Taking the gun out of the policeman's hand is the surest way to make all people victims of laws. Now, here's something that I, I remember reading years ago and I thought, that is so true. Some of you may be familiar with it, but it makes so much sense. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 has this to say and I'm going to read it from several translations the NIV it puts it like this when a sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong the New Living Translation when a crime is not punished quickly people feel it is safe to do wrong the English Standard Version because a sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. The King James says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of man is fully set in them to do evil. How true is that? Think about that. Just how true is that? Here again, it's like a headline from from the last year or so. I think we, we should realize that, that if we would follow what God says to do, things would change completely. Anybody got any comments on that? Perfectly clear. <laughs> All right. Verse 5. There are twin reasons for the Christian's observance of society's law. First, as a matter of conscience, it is a sin for him to break the law. And second, in order that he might, he or she might not incur the legal penalty of law breaking. The preeminent consideration is that of pleasing God. As Peter expressed it, obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, 1 Peter 2.13. And verse 6, Thus all that was said of police men and women in Romans 13 verses 1 through 5 is likewise applied here to all servants and officers of the secular state, being part of the institution ordained of God, which is the state. They partake of the dignity and authority pertaining to it and are entitled to obedience, respect, and courtesy. Now, when you read that, and also honor, you read that, I think you get back down to the policeman. Now, you get stopped, you've been speeding or something, 
You know, he's trying to be as courteous as possible, but what's going through your mind? Hmm. Have a good day, sir. Right. <laughs> You've already ruined my day. But you see the point. And here again, may have saved your life by stopping you right then from speeding down the road. It's hard for us to look at it from that point of view. But here again, our human nature automatically thinks what? Oh, this guy's just, he just loves this. He likes handing out those tickets. And he gave me one. So maybe the next time, you know, I know I might be hard, but thank, I appreciate this ticket. Thank you very much. Of course, he might think you're nuts too, but, but anyway, he said, you could have saved my life. And the cooperation of all Christians who in the discharge of such obligations are doing so as unto the Lord and not as unto men. Colossians 3.23 For such is the commandment of scriptures. Let's go back over to Matthew and chapter 17. I think that's where I want to be. 17 verses 20 through 27. <clears throat> now, here again, it has to do with our relationship with the government. Now you might think if I could do what's talked about here, I wouldn't have the problem of paying taxes. But okay, here, let's take a look at Matthew 17, 24 through 27. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house and Jesus was the first to speak, what do you think, Simon, he asked? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. <clears throat> then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake, throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Now, if we could do that, we probably wouldn't feel so bad about damn taxes either. But you see the point. Jesus is saying, you owe this, you pay that, irregardless of how you feel about it. All right, something else here. Let's look at uh, chapter Matthew 22. Twenty-two verses fifteen through twenty-two, and we find this. <clears throat> this concerns uh, religious leaders question Jesus about paying taxes. You got to remember sitting here. This was Rome. They had these tax collectors and. They just weren't very honest people. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodian. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to what they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? It is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Notice how they flatter him and they said to him, they're setting him up. Ever been done that way? Of course, most of us. But Jesus had the right answer. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. Don't you wish you could have good answers like that every time some question came up? You'd have a wisdom that the Lord had. If we continue with the Bible, we can develop a good wisdom to answer many questions of, of this life. Okay, verse 7. 
Before leaving this section of Romans, which details the relationship of the Christian to his government, one other consideration needs emphasis, such as the attractiveness to the masses of mankind of the idea of overthrowing governments, which they consider unjust or oppressive. That even Christian ministers sometimes make a distinction between obeying good governments and bad governments, actually suggesting in their logic that it is all right for conscientious and well-intentioned activists to go forth and pull down the government if they think it is bad. No. A Christian is prohibited from any such role, nor may he even resist, verse 2 of chapter 13. A conclusion that is based not alone on what Paul wrote here, but also upon the fact that no Christian of the apostolic age ever did anything remotely akin to pulling down the government. You know, when we read a lot, we see that. We don't see Christians uh, uprising against authority. All right, we'll move to, to a new section here, an ex exhortation to love and for moral purity. And this will be verses 8 through 14. Let's read those together. It's a subtitle that love fulfills the law. And then the second part of it, the day is near. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever, whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come. For you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. <clears throat> Lots of good things mentioned in, in those verses of what to do and, and not to do. I don't know about you, but I need these reminders daily because how quickly we can fall back into the things that we should not be doing. It's, it's human nature, and I'll, I'll stress that point time and time again. And that's what God has us taking, trying to take care of for us all through all the scripture. And if we can keep that in mind, we might visit the scripture more on a daily basis and say, how am I going to live today? Here's what I'm going to do today. I just take a little piece here. And this is what God said. I can do that today. I might be able to make even somebody else want to do something good today. So if we can live like that, I, I think we'll be okay. Verse 8. The discharge of all debts and the keeping of all commandments is summed up in the one word, of man's loving others as he or she loves themselves. Verse 9, the Christian life is realized not by an item tabulation of commandments kept or broken, but by a conscious filling of the heart with love toward others, a fulfillment being made possible only by the sacred enthronement within of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, you know, you think about self-love. <clears throat> is this wrong? Well, it depends on what kind it is, but we need a little bit of that. Let me share a note with you. Somehow, many of us have gotten the idea that self-love is wrong. But if this were the case, it would be pointless to love our neighbors as ourselves. But Paul explains what he means by self-love. Even if you have low self-esteem, you probably don't willingly let yourself go hungry. You clothe yourself reasonably well. You make sure there's a roof over your head if you can. You try not to let yourself be cheated or injured. And you get angry if someone tries to ruin your marriage. This is the kind of love we need to have for our neighbors. Do we see that others are fed, clothed, and housed as well as they can be? Are we concerned about issues of social justice? Loving others as ourselves means to be actively working to see that their needs are met. Interestingly, people who focus on others rather than on themselves rarely suffer from self-esteem. <clears throat> and you know, you say, well, w when you think about that, isn't that the essence of all of Even our coming together, God wants us to come together. Just think if we fail to do that, we encourage each other by being here. I'm encouraged. I can look at it and say, well, I'm talking to somebody. But you have opportunities to encourage other Christians. And I think by encouraging each other, that helps us to be in, able to encourage those out there in the world that need to know Jesus. That's why this is stressed so much. You know, this type of love that, that's talked about here is not one of these whiny kind of things. It's a, it's a real love, a concern for people. And there's different types of love mentioned throughout the Bible. All right. <clears throat> Verse 10. Let me share another note. <clears throat> Christians must obey the law of love which supersedes both religious and civil laws. How easy it is to excuse our indifference to others merely because we have no legal obligation to help them, and even to justify harming them if our actions are technically legal. But Jesus does not leave loopholes in the law of love. Whenever love demands it, we are to go beyond human legal requirements and imitate the God of love. I'd like us to take a look at a couple of scriptures. First of all, James chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> James chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. And then in verses 16 and 17 of that same chapter, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, is not, if not accompanied by action, is dead. You know, here's the thing, when we go through scripture, a lot of times we like to read it and say, oh, that sounds so good. That sounds good. I like that. But the flip side of that is, behind everything that, that God has put in there, there is action on our part to reach out to others, to do for others, because that's how we have an influence for the Lord in the world. And even among ourselves. It's very important. Verse 11. This is eternally true of them that sleep from either lethargy, I think I got that right, well, you know what I mean, or sin. It is positively not required in understanding this verse to believe that Paul thought the second advent of Christ was to be expected any day. 
Paul's mention here of a spiritual condition called sleep and his call for people to waken out of it provide strong emphasis upon the dangers of such stupor. The person who sleeps is in a state of insensibility, not knowing anything that is going on. Consider different types of sleep that we see in scripture. Well, I'd like to make this comment. I'm gonna look at some wrong kinds of sleep, but there are good sleep. You think about when, when you go to sleep and you know as a Christian, we, we should have a, a good conscience, even though there's things that keep us awake, but normally we can sleep pretty good. As you get older, that gets harder, but still you can sleep pretty good. And you wake up, and it's a new day, and you feel rested. I think of that time when we pass from this life, you know cemetery from scripture means place of rest. So there, there we are, we're resting. We're gonna be raised up one day, and as Christians, we're going to an eternal rest. So remember, there are, are different kinds of sleep. The sleep I'm going to talk about here is not the kind of sleep we should have. Some sleep the sleep of Jonah, an unrealistic sleep. He went aboard a ship, putting out to sea, descended into the hole of the vessel, and went to sleep. Not even the mighty storm which descended upon them aroused him. What a perfect picture is that of a man who will not face reality. Many a sinner is sleeping the sleep of Jonah. Sin is a roaring tornado all around. It reaches out to destroy. It tosses to and fro. But people give no heed. They are asleep. Now let's take a look at Ephesians on this over in chapter 5 and look at verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 13 and 14. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, we understand this. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Jonah, I don't know who's listening out there. Maybe this is new to them, but look in the book of Jonah and you'll find this story. It's really a great story. We always talk about the great fish, but there's more to that story than just the great fish. All right, number two. Some sleep the sleep of the weary, as did the disciples, Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were tired. That tremendous week in Jerusalem had been enough nearly to overwhelm them. The tired fishermen of Galilee were not accustomed to being stretched out in such an endurance contest as that which marked the Lord's final week. It was hectic. They simply could not stand the strain and went to sleep. The spiritual counterpart of this is seen everywhere. People tire of the ceaseless struggle, become worn out with the dull routine, and numb by the deadly monotony, they fall asleep. But while they nod, Judas is making a deal with the high priest, and in a little while, the soldiers will appear to lead the Lord away. Of such, one can hear the master say, what could you not watch with me one hour? When you read that, you think, I want to fall asleep. But here again, uh, when you put yourself in, in the situation they were in, do you think they loved the Lord and cared for Him? Yeah. Why did they fall asleep? They were tired. But yet Jesus said this to him, but you gotta remember the stress that Jesus was under too. And you can hear yourself saying that to your best friend or something. Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, if you want to read the complete context of that, you 
It's found in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 46. Share one more sleep. <clears throat> I've got several, but they'll take care of our time. Some sleep the sleep of presumption, like Samson upon the knees of Delilah. There was a man who knew all the dangers, but slept anyway. He could always rise to the occasion. He could always go out and shake himself at, as, at other times. So he thought and was therefore contemptuous of the danger. He couldn't be hurt. Many today sleep like that. They know the folly and peril of the neglect of prayer, study, and worship. They know how deadly is the sting of sin, but they sleep. I know, I know the truth, they cry, but they sleep anyway. And while they sleep, there comes inevitably the hour when it is too late. And for them, as for Samson, they are led away to the blinding arms and the mill and the work of a donkey until life is ended. Why will people not wake up? This story, again, if you're not familiar with it, is in Judges chapter 16. All right, I'm going to quit there. i got uh, three more examples of sleep from the scripture, but you get the point. There is kind of sleep you don't want. There is a good sleep, too. Are there any comments? That's it, huh? Okay, well... I'm glad I, I covered that so well. <laughs> I know there's uh, sometimes uh, I think that when we look at the scripture, we're used to looking at it in a way that it, it's kind of bland. And I've said this before, you read this, somebody said something. But if you could be looking them in the face, just like Paul would be animated. Like when you talk to somebody, you get clues from them what they're thinking, right? I, I've seen it as a preacher. You look out there and somebody's going, hmm, I don't know about that. You can just tell. But that's the difference of being face-to-face -face with people. We forget that with these people in the Bible. They don't just say, be a good Christian. And Paul's adamant in what he's wanting to do. He's adamant in the things that he's telling us. That's the exciting part of the scripture. Joanne? This is a little bit different, but Don Williams, which was the country singer, mm -hmm. he was a member of the church. And a lot of his songs, he talked about how loved he was and how he was worshipped in love through the baptism. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. and you, you see a person and they have influence too. Yeah, he was the general genre. Yeah, yeah, I agree. He, he was a good singer. You know, the other thing, I don't know who it was, but one of the singers said in the Church of Christ, we know every first and last verse of the hymns and the books. So, we sing more than that. It's not what we know. Dennis. Okay. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, once again, we're grateful for this time that we could be here. We're grateful for those who are listening. We're, we just ask a special blessing on each one that's here today and, and help us to take what we, we read in the scripture and apply it to our lives. Not only to help us, but to help those around us and help us to always desire to do those things that you'd want us to do. We'd also ask that you look after our members that need special care at this time. and Put your hand of comfort upon them and help us to say a kind word or something that's encouraging if we have the opportunity. Help us to always be encouragers. Help us to look around and realize it doesn't hurt to smile or say hello or just say, how are you today? Because we realize 
You bless us richly. You give us a life to live abundantly. You take care of us not only here, but we will be taken care of in the hereafter. And dear God, that's a wonderful thing. And we thank you for all these things. In your son Jesus' name, amen.
I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Thankful that you're here today. Uh, begin to think. Sometimes I wake up on a first day of the week on a Sunday morning, and I want you to reflect back to the week that you just finished. And there are some of you that you had a really great week, and maybe you woke up this morning just uh, eager to praise God and give thanks for the good things you experienced. Uh, for others of you, you might have thought, well. Now that week I could do without, right? You had some things you had to work through. And hopefully you came together, come together today, this morning, uh, you can still thank God. Praise God that he brought you through that and that you're here this morning and able to worship. I'm glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us, a special welcome extended to you. I hope that you'll be encouraged and uplifted by the time together. Uh, for those that may be watching online, we still have folks that are engaged uh, both within our community and sometimes outside of the area. We're glad that they're uh, with us today and hope that uh, the time together this morning will be a benefit to them as well. Um, Drew's gonna come and continue in our song service this morning as we worship God as a family together.
verse, both verses. <clears throat> to God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done, great things he has taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great Seven hundred and fifty-six. <clears throat> First, second, and last verse. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace in the mansions bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway clouds will overspread the sky but when traveling days are over not a shadow not a sigh when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be Jesus' name, 
On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. <clears throat> before prayer, we'll sing number 730, all three verses. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. this opportunity we have to be here and worship you and praise you and honor you deserving of all of our praise. We're so thankful for Jesus, his example, his life, and his willingness to come here and go to that cross for us. We're so thankful that you can forgive our sins because of Jesus. Make us pure in your eyes. What a blessing that is. Father, help us to renew our minds each time we come. If we change our thoughts, we change our actions, we can change our life. We can change the future. Father, we, we always strive to follow you, but we are sinners and we make mistakes. 
But each day we get to start over, learn from the past, make this a new day, do better today than we did yesterday. Father, we realize there's many problems in the world, but we come here each week and realize there's sunshine in this room because of you. Help us to look at the positives. You're a father. You can help us through all our difficulties, no matter what they may be. Father, improve our attitude because many times we, we get down because of things. But we just need to look at things differently. You're a father. You'll help us. You give us power and strength. So let us have faith and confidence in you that you'll help us through all our difficulties. You love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before communion, we'll sing number 764, all three verses. When we meet in sweet communion, where the peace divine is spread, hearts are brought in closer union, while from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we have also believed and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in, in his presence. All of this is for your benefit, so that grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For the light and the momentary troubles are achieving us an eternal glory that is far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what, un what is unseen is eternal. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We're thankful so much for all that you do for us, most of all for your son. We're thankful for the life that he lived here on earth, the example and, and, and uh, from your word that we can uh, reflect upon the way that he lived his life here on earth. 
Uh, but most of all, Father, with that sacrifice that he paid. Father, as we're about to partake of this bread that represents his body, help us to reflect upon uh, the life that he lived. As we uh, look at that example that he lived, help us to be imitators of that life. Uh, help us to continue to walk in the light and, and to everything that we do that will always bring you glory. Uh, again, we thank you for all the love and ask a blessing upon each and every one of us as we partake. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. bow with me again. Tell me, Father, we come before you again asking a special blessing upon this cup, the cup that represents the blood of Jesus and the blood that washes us free from our sins. Father, we uh, again thank you for that sacrifice. We look forward to the day that we get to be with you in heaven, but until then, Father, we ask that you uh, just continue to be with us. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us, uh, help us to be Throughout our walk, help us to, to see the things that you want us to see and, and, and do the things that uh, we need to do to, to, again, bring you glory and and to help others in ways that, that, uh, that Jesus would do. Uh, again, Father, we uh, thank you for the love that you have for us, and, and we look forward to, towards that day. But again, uh, until, until then, just, again, bless everyone that uh, partakes of this cup. In Jesus' name, amen.
you'd like to mark the invitation song, it'll be number 655. But before the lesson, we'll sing number 415. First, second, and last verse. <clears throat> More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. About Jesus, let me learn more of His holy will. Discern, Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness. See, more of His love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches of glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. I'll be reading 1 John 1, verses 10 through, no, 5, 10 through 5, or 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him, one another, and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us, us of our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. I encourage you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 if you're not already there. Matthew chapter 6. It's a significant week. School year is about to start. And I know that brings a lot of joy to some people and not so much joy to others. Um, maybe it's worth a, a moment of our time to specifically pray for the beginning of the school year here, for our own students, teachers, and again, for those within our communities. Let's, let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, we do um, think about the beginning of the school year as it starts here in just a few days for many and others here in the very near future. Uh, we pray for all of our students. Uh, we think about those maybe even starting preschool um, and learning just how to, to interact with uh, their peers and learning to share and learning some very basics. Think about those at the youngest grade level, levels uh, learning um, academics and, and, and subjects and things that, that are new to them as they continue to grow and, and uh, we pray for those that are, are teenagers and the challenges that they face as they uh, go into the classroom and, and learn uh, again uh, the things that are taught but also learning to deal with uh, the temptations that are out there, uh, the peer pressure that exists. And we pray for each of these. Pray for our college students and those that, that uh, study. Uh, some continue to do much of that virtually and online but others away from home. I pray for the challenges that they face. Father, for all of our teachers and those that uh, serve and other members of, of staff uh, for schools here in our community, uh, we pray for each one. We've got a lot of folks that are starting again new experiences as they walk into new schools for the first time. 
and we lift them up to you. Grateful for the many uh, within our church family who have uh, served in this way, who have invested their, their lives and their careers into making a difference in the, in the lives of young people. And uh, we've got others within our church family who have, have retired from that work. We're thankful for them. Uh, just bless those in our community, specifically this year, maybe more than others, as there's been some uh, unrest within our community when it comes to the schools and how things function. And I pray that this year will be a good year uh, for all of those that will be involved. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to encourage our young people. And we lift them up to you now and uh, protect them, watch over them, keep them safe from, from harm, and help them make good choices. Help them be a light uh, to those around them and help to surround them with good influences as well. Uh, God, thank you for hearing our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, where we'll be. Last week I started off by telling you a little story about a, a dog that didn't quite like me. Uh, I got another dog story. You seemed to enjoy that so well last week. Uh, this week, Earlier this week, I tried to get out a lot of mornings and walk in my neighborhood. And it's funny, when you, you walk in a particular neighborhood, you kind of get to know the, the dogs and the pets in the neighborhood. I already know I can anticipate the dogs that will uh, bark from a distance. And I know the ones, you know, that uh, they're, they're not, you know, I don't have any reason to be afraid. Uh, most of them are behind a fence or off in the distance, and they're not going to do me any harm. I smile and wave, and I try to be friendly. Uh, but this past week, I encountered a dog I'd never seen before, and it created a tense moment or two. Uh, you see, I was walking down the street, and suddenly, from around the corner of this house, came this large dog. I'm telling you, it was it was like a small horse. Yeah, that's how big this dog was, if you can just imagine with me. And this dog is coming at me. Now, it's amazing how much thinking you can do in a matter of seconds. But I could, in that brief moment, I could look and think to myself, the dog looked pretty harmless. I saw more tongue wagging than I did teeth showing, right? So I'm thinking, you know, if he does come all the way up to me, uh, I don't think I'm going to have to be on the receiving end of any harm. So the dog is coming my way, and then right behind the dog, as soon as it comes around the corner, though, there is a young boy. Probably, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he was 18, 19 years old. That's about how old he looked. He came from behind, chasing after the dog. And when he saw the dog was headed my way, he kind of picked up his pace. He kind of called out to the dog and, and chasing after the dog as if, um, and, and I got to tell you, when that happened, all of a sudden my worry level went up just a little bit. I thought the way this guy is chasing after the dog, maybe this dog doesn't like strangers, doesn't like people kind of getting anywhere near their front yard. So I got to tell you, I was a little bit concerned and I was thankful that, that this gentleman was able to catch up the animal just before it got to the sidewalk and uh, take it, you know, by the, uh, by the uh, midsection and grab a hold of the collar to keep the dog from, well, maybe licking me to death. I don't know. But, um, you know, I got to thinking in a spiritual sense. As I went along the rest of my way, I thought, you know, it's interesting to me that I saw that dog and I made an observation on my own account thinking, um, you know, he didn't present any danger or threat to me. But after I saw the look on the owner's face, after I heard him call out and kind of increase his uh, speed trying to chase after the dog, I thought, you know what? I was a little bit more concerned. I was more concerned because the owner, I was convinced 100% that the owner knew that animal better than I did. Right? And I begin to think in a spiritual sense that when it comes to our study of God's Word, there are things oftentimes that maybe we read, maybe we, we kind of digest and we think about, we meditate upon, and maybe we... Um, you know, we, we attempt to take seriously everything that God says, but maybe we would do well to realize that these words come from the creator of the universe. You know, to know that he uh, created the world, he created us, he knows our thoughts, he knows our hearts, he knows our emotions, he knows best. He knows the things that are a threat to us, that are a danger to us. And so we should trust in him in that regard. And I felt like that thought kind of spurred me on as I went along that way and throughout the rest of this week preparing for a lesson that I knew would be a little bit of a challenge to teach this morning because I've spoken on this particular subject before and it's always been difficult. Difficult to speak on and difficult from what I hear from those who would struggle with it. You see in Matthew chapter 6, and we kind of skimmed over this a little bit last week, there's a section where Jesus talked about prayer. And in verse 7, he, remember he said, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, 
for they think they will be heard with their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And Jesus then goes on to say, pray then like this. And it's interesting because he then proceeds with the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer as it's oftentimes known. One that many of you could quote from memory. Maybe one that at times in your life you have said, maybe you have said as a prayer yourself. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, see, it's not the only place in the scriptures that we find that prayer given. It's also in Luke chapter 11, under a little bit of a different context. In Luke 11, the disciples, hearing Jesus pray, specifically ask him, you know, can you teach us to pray? And Jesus then goes and gives them that model prayer in a very similar way. The wording is almost identical. But what's interesting to me is you read through that, and if you look at that prayer, there, there are lots of things that we read that um, we, we, get a, we, we, we understand fairly well. When he addresses God as our Father in heaven, and he, and he, he offers praise and recognition, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We could, we could read that and understand, again, that part of our, our prayer life consists of asking God for things. And maybe we need to be reminded to look at that prayer that simply God, what Jesus says, is, is look for that which to sustain you just for that day ahead. Not to worry, which is again another part of this Sermon on the Mount, not to worry about things that are way out in the future. But then Jesus sticks this part in the prayer that almost would make me think, I, maybe it would be best to kind of skip over this. Because Jesus says that part of this prayer is to forgive us, God, of our debts. But he adds in, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And it's an interesting thought. And I don't know if those who were, were listening at that moment, whether Jesus could see that they, they heard those words, Maybe their eyes got a little bit big. Maybe they, they could see the look on their face like, wait a second, we're, we're supposed to forgive people as we also have forgiven others? That's, that's, a, that's a deep concept. You know, and then when Jesus says, and deliver us from evil, he goes on and almost seems like, I'm going to add a little bit more to make sure I cover this area of forgiveness in case you struggle with it. Look at verse 14. Jesus says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, that is, that's a challenge. Wow, that's hard. And, and I, don't, I don't think that, that that's covered anywhere else when it comes to other. I don't recall Jesus ever saying at some point, you know, uh, that, that God's going to love us as much as we love others. Right? But there's a connection that Jesus spells out between the forgiveness that we extend to our fellow man and the forgiveness that we hope for or should expect to receive from him. And again, as I looked at that and I thought about speaking this morning on this very subject, I know how hard it is. For you see, when I've preached on this before, I've had even some of you. I've had others in other places who have come to me who have said, with sincerity and honesty and sometimes uh, with, with just something that realizes that, it, that it's hard, they've spoken to me and said, Rick, I can't do it. I've had some that have confessed that forgiveness is such a challenge that, that I cannot realistically, and, and usually it's kind of followed up with, you, you, you don't know my past. You don't know what, what's been done to me. You don't know uh, my circumstances. They're, they're kind of unusual. Once in a while, someone might elaborate. Others, they, they kind of spare me maybe for some, some gruesome details that may exist as part of their life. But I share all that to say that I recognize this is difficult. And I would imagine it was no less difficult for those who would hear Jesus' words there. As Jesus would preach about this, would deliver this message, and again, not only as part of the prayer, but then to follow it up, 
to say, I want you to understand how important this concept of forgiveness is. That if you do not take it seriously, if you do not keep in mind your attitude toward others, that affects your spiritual relationship, your relationship with your Father in heaven. Now, some of you, again, maybe, because, again, I've heard it both ways. I've heard some who say, Rick, this is a struggle. I can't forgive. But I don't think they've questioned whether God's going to forgive them. Others might sit here and hear those words, and it causes you to tremble just a little bit. To think, yes, I struggle with forgiveness. And, and are, you, are you saying that that means that I can expect that God's going to have difficulty or, or God will not forgive me? Well, it's a challenge, isn't it? You know, and as I've spent time thinking, what, what more could be said? What could be added to what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 6 that may help us? And I decided on going to Luke chapter 15. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. You know, as, as you're turning there, you know that, that that chapter contains three parables. And I, boy, I've preached on these three parables before. Made reference to each of these or, or all three of these on numerous occasions. You've read them on your own. But maybe this will help us today in thinking about the idea of forgiveness. In this particular chapter, it needs to be said from the very beginning that Jesus tells these parables because of circumstances that had taken place right then. See, he was surrounded by tax collectors and sinners. People who were known to be that way. People who didn't have the best reputations. And at the time, the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, and they were saying, here, here's what they were saying in verse uh, 2, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They didn't think that was very becoming for someone who should be held in such high regard, that he would take these people. They questioned whether Jesus even knew how bad these people were. And Jesus, aware of this, proceeds to tell these three parables. And you can't help but think that, uh, boy, he's really trying to drive home his point. And so he tears a parable first of a lost sheep, of a man who holds a hundred sheep, and yet one wanders away. And this, this, this shepherd, the one who owns the sheep, these are his possessions, cares so much about the one sheep that he leaves the 99, going after it, finding it. And not giving up until he finds it, bringing it home on his shoulders, rejoicing. And he comes home, calling his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice, I found my sheep that was lost. And Jesus says in Luke 15, verse 7, Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You know, And as if Jesus needed to make sure that his point was received, he proceeds right into telling a, a, a parable that's very similar. A woman having lost ten coins, and Luke lost one coin out of ten, and she immediately turns her house upside down. She's diligently looking for the coin, sweeping, and, and, and it wasn't going to give up until she finds it. And when she does, she calls her friends and says, I want you to rejoice with me. What I found has now been lost. And Jesus says again in verse 10, I tell you, there's joy oh, before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And Jesus, again, if, if not to say, I've got, to, I've got to really make my point, proceeds to tell a third parable. And it's almost as if the first two kind of was a kind of warm-up act because the third parable is so much more detailed and has all kinds of additional layers that you can peel back. And it involves people, not a sheep, not a coin, but a son. Well, a son who'd be labeled as a prodigal. A one who, who kind of wandered off on his own. You couldn't blame the sheep who maybe wasn't very bright and kind of just got himself away from the other sheep. And you couldn't, obviously, a coin, an animal object that suddenly was misplaced or lost. We could relate to that. But, but I guarantee the woman didn't pick up the coin and say, you, you silly coin. Right? The coin had nothing to do with being lost. But yet in this particular case, there's someone who had willfully chosen to leave his father, to leave the comfort of home, to leave what was good, to pursue what he wanted to do. And Jesus tells the story, and he said, there was a man who had two sons, and we're verse 11, verse 12 now, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. He divided his property between them. And not many days later, in verse 13, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. 
As I read through this parable, you know, some, it's interesting how you can read something dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and then something new pops out. And, and suddenly this particular occasion, I was reading that and thinking, not many days later, indicating a little bit of period, period of time had passed. And I couldn't help but think, what kind of dialogue may have been taking place? Was the father involved? Was the father saying, you know, son, have you thought this through? Have, are you sure you don't want to reconsider? It's not too late to change your mind. Regardless of what happened during that time, the younger son takes, goes on a journey into a far country, and it seems like he had an intention, a purpose. Because it doesn't say that he, that he uh, spent some time thinking about what he was going to do. He'd already done that at home. And, and whether it was uh, immediately or very quickly, it says that he squandered the property in reckless living. In verse 14, when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. And we're so familiar with that story, and we, we kind of identify a little bit with, with what he's going through. But I, forever, I, my attention has always kind of shifted because of what happens next is the, the rich part of the story and the part that brings about maybe warm feelings in your heart. Because it says the young man came to his senses. He came to himself. And he says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I'll arise and go to my father. I'll say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father, obviously looking, keeping his eyes open, maybe anticipating this moment would come, not sure when it would be. But his father sees him and he feels compassion. He runs and embraces him and kisses him. Verse 21, the son begins his rehearsed dialogue. Father, I've sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father seems to neglect. Seems like he didn't hear those words. Seems he certainly didn't address those things. He said in verse 22, But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. And if we just stop right there, that story kind of mirrors the other two. But again, there's this other part of the story that's, that's preached on often, and, and it certainly needs to be. Because there's an older son. There's an older brother who's out in the field, and he comes near the house, and he hears that there's a party going on. And he thinks to himself, I wasn't aware of any kind of celebration that should be taking place. It's not my birthday. I don't know any other event that could be causing this kind of activity. So he calls one of the servants and says, what, what's going on here? And in verse 27, the servants reply, as your brothers come, your father has killed the fattened calf, and because he's received him back, safe and sound. The older brother becomes angry, upset. He refuses to go in. Word somehow reaches the father, who goes out, and it says, uh, entreats him. And in verse 29, he tells his father this, Look, these many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you've never given me a young goat that I might simply just celebrate with my friends. But with the son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Again, that same point driven home on three separate parables of how God would view people who are, would be considered sinners, those who are in need of repentance. How, how eager he is to have them back and how much celebration will take place for those who were once lost, but now they are found. But see, I look at that parable and, you know, oftentimes I focus on the older son because, again, there's an attitude that he's got that probably we, we can all relate to. I remember when I was younger, I'd read that and go, well, I'm, I'm an older brother. I can identify with this because that certainly doesn't seem fair the treatment doesn't seem just with what's taking place. As I've gotten older, I can see now more through the eyes of the father. You know, once, once you become a father, you, you see things a little bit differently. 
And, and I've always looked at Luke 15. I understood the Father to represent God, ready to welcome those who would return home. Also, you could also make the case for you know, allowing those who would desire to go and, and live their own life, make their own choices. God gives us that freedom, that, that open, you know, that will that we have to do what we want. Certainly we know what he wants, but he gives us that ability to choose. I've oftentimes looked at that, but I don't know if I've spent enough time until this week reflecting on what's going on here and thinking, you know what? Forget the older son, forget the father, but for a moment, can I reflect on the young man who went out? Could I put myself in his shoes? Could I look at his story and think, why, I could identify with that. Now, it seems kind of hard-pressed in a way because we, we, it seems like he's, he's so careless. seems like he never once, this entire time, is ever thinking about anybody but himself. That's why I say those words that I think to myself, hey, I can't identify. You know, there are moments when I don't be, I'm not mindful of other people like I should. Maybe I'm not mindful of, of the spiritual implications of my choices, but I might just simply be focused on myself. And this younger son is calculated in his own world he doesn't care about anybody else's feelings at this point. I just want to do what I want to do. And again, I can relate to that. Probably for our kids, we got, we got a row of some high school students down here, and some of them are, are not that far along before they'll be able to drive and get their license, right? Probably if you ask them, they were, they're ready for that moment to start, right? They're ready for that to happen. And probably all of us, maybe when we were younger, the words left our lips. I can't wait to grow up. Parents, you've heard maybe your kids say that. And you just smile and you just say, oh, it'll happen. Because you can tell their, their approach when they say that, that they're eager for all the freedoms that come. And they haven't really thought through all the responsibilities that kind of are handcuffed to those freedoms. So I think to myself of one who desired that so much, desiring to go out, to live his own life. And again, Jesus would characterize what he did as squandering his property in reckless living. Reckless or, or wild, uh, the way of life that would simply imply with no thought toward the future, with no thought toward consequences for his actions. Just simply to live in the moment. And again, I could find myself thinking, hey, do I do that on occasion? Absolutely. We live in a society, we live in a world, and, and that's even a catchphrase that some would even say, you only live once, right? To live life and, and to enjoy it and live it up. And that's what this young man did. And he would go, and, and circumstances were such that once everything was gone, we have to assume that he was surrounded by other people who probably enjoyed the ability to help squander that living, squander the property and reckless living. But just so happened, there happened to be a famine that came through right after that. When suddenly it was difficult to even have your basic needs met. And just the, the timing was pretty poor for him, or, or it just didn't turn out very well, because suddenly he's got nothing. He's in need. He doesn't have even the, the necessities, the things to, to help sustain him. And in a, in a moment of desperation, he goes and hires himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. This was the very best he could do, right? You feel like the world today, you feel like you probably have any job you want. Every place is hiring. Everybody is shorthanded. You could do pretty well for yourself to go and earn a few quick bucks. But this is all he could find in order to try to, again, bring about some semblance of just being able to survive. And it says that he's longing to feed, longing to be fed with the pies that he is helping to provide for the pigs. But it says nobody gave him anything. See, nobody even nearby, nobody who saw his, his, his dilemma, nobody offered him any assistance or help. See, the more that I look at that, the more that I think what might have been going through this 
young man's mind, the more I can relate. And so it comes to this young man's, he comes to his senses, comes to himself, thinks, you know what, I should just go back home. Because at the very least, if I beg and plead, and if I, you know, uh, admit to the father what I've done, not fully understanding the father is fully aware of it, but if I acknowledge it, then at the very least, I could become a servant for my father. And I know how they lived. I've grown up in that home. I've seen that they, they do better than I'm doing now. I wonder again, and I know this isn't spelled out, and you, you could maybe argue as you read through this, because again, the main point of the parable, I believe, because of what Jesus was teaching, was to indicate again how important sinners were to him, how valuable people were, these lost souls who needed to be searched for and found and brought back into the fold. I think that's significant. I don't want to overlook that. But I can't help but read through this parable and think, well, what did that young man feel like? What did he think? You know, what stopped him? What caused him to suddenly come to his senses? There was a time prior to him coming, you know, uh, and having these thoughts of going back when he could have, but he didn't want to at that point. Was it pride? Because, boy, that could stop him. Could I relate to that? Haven't been so prideful that man, I don't want to go back and admit that I was wrong. I could only imagine that this younger son already knew, probably, if he were asked, how's your younger, older brother going to feel about this? I have a feeling like he knew. I know my older brother won't be happy to see me. During those days when I was packing all my possessions up, he probably wouldn't speak to me. He probably was, was not happy with me that I was leaving more work for him to do. What about, uh, you know, this young man as he thought, you know, if I go back, I'm going I'm to be surrounded by people who know the choices that I've made. There are going to be some that maybe say, I told you so. There are going to be some who say, you know what, You've, uh, you blew it. What a, what, a, what a failure you are. I'm going to be on the receiving end of, of criticism. All these thoughts could have been flooding his mind. And suddenly, though, those weren't the main concern. So as he realizes, I'm going to come back to my father. I'm, I'm going to overlook some of these things. So I don't what happens to me going forward. I'm going to go back and throw myself at my father's, you know, and, and it's beg him for mercy. And he received a response that I don't think he could have predicted in a million years. There was never, if he had, he would have made the choice a lot sooner. But when he comes back and admits to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, what does he receive? Uh, you know, right? And it's more than just the gift. It's more than the undeserved uh, accolades that are put his way. Suddenly to have a celebration and to bring out, uh, you know, uh, bring out the, a robe and bring out, you know, the, the shoes and, and all these things, a, a ring on his hand. All these things that I want brought to him, that it would have been easy for him to say, you know, I'm not deserving of any of this, any of this attention. This is not what I want. I didn't want to reclaim my position as a, as a son. You just simply make me a servant. I would have been content with that. I would have been happy with that. But the son receives forgiveness. He's forgiven by his father. All those things were, were that were... He had been guilty of had been overlooked there wasn't uh, there wasn't any conditional process as part of this the father didn't say all right i've got a robe shoes and and a, and a ring for your uh finger but first i want you to sign this contract that you're going to pay back everything that you blew I, i'm going to have you uh, agree that you're never going to put us through this again i'm going to have agree i'm going to have i'm going to have to ask you some questions to make sure that your heart is right and that you're legitimately coming back and not going to make life miserable for all of us. The father instead just simply granted him forgiveness because he was there. He'd returned home. And again, when I read through this parable a lot this week and thought to myself, if I am like that younger son and I can relate more than I care to admit, hopefully I can also relate to the idea of being one who was forgiven. 
one who's been forgiven by God. So I say all that to say we go back to Matthew chapter 6 and we think about how difficult is it for those who would hear Jesus' words then, how difficult it would be for those who read these words today on August 1st, 2021. That we should pray, forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Not something I hear often prayed. Not something I'll confess to you. Not something that I've prayed often myself. God, forgive me of my sins as I have forgiven others of the wrongs that they've done to me. Or if we read those verses in 14 and 15 to say, if you forgive others your trespasses, your heavenly Father is going to forgive you. Boy, I want forgiveness. I need forgiveness. And hopefully, from being reminded of that prodigal son, we can also relate to the forgiveness that we've experienced. How many of you could go back, and maybe we need to do so, and reflect back when we came out of the waters of baptism. And I know I've had conversations with people through the years who in moments that followed indicated to me that they felt like a new person. They felt clean. They, they felt like they, they recognized the weight, the burden of sin had been removed from them. Maybe if you can relate to that, we do well to hearken back to that thought and to that memory and hold on to it again. Maybe we overlook, maybe we've forgotten, we've forgotten where we came from, where we were at one point when God chose to forgive us, when we responded in obedience and just throwing ourselves at, at his mercy. And we received forgiveness from those sins. And, and maybe if we did that, we'd have an easier time to forgive others. Because again, I know this is a challenge. I know it's hard for some more than others. Because again, when I think about others who have wronged me, and, and maybe some of you could think about those situations, and boy, it, it hurts to consider. Some of you have those wounds, they, they run deep. Hopefully you can be reminded of the forgiveness extended to you already by your Heavenly Father. That you might be willing to embrace what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. And as I said from the very beginning, you know, when I, when I kind of use that illustration with the big dog, you know, trusting that the owner knows best. Guys, I'm going I'm to trust. Family, I want you to think about, I'm going to trust that God's way is best. And that if forgiveness is something that I have not extended when I need to, that I've got to understand that God knows what he's talking about. He created us. He knows the effect of an unforgiving heart. Sure, he knows what an unrepentant heart could do for a sinner, but he also recognizes the hearts of all his people. And if we are unforgiving, the harm that that could do for us, for our spiritual condition. And he doesn't want us to withhold forgiveness for our fellow man. He wants us to freely forgive. And again, holds out to us that when we embrace that, when we choose that life, he in like manner will freely forgive us when we repent, when we come back to him. What a feeling of forgiveness. The young prodigal son experienced it. If Jesus, that was a story, a parable, but I can't imagine what was life like going forward. I don't know. Did the older son and younger son mend ways a little bit? We don't know. That wasn't, again, the main point. But I have to believe that the younger son thought about that moment, that the moment when his father embraced him and kissed him and showered him with affection and ignored his pleas just for, for you know, forgiveness and, and confession of sin but just simply to say, welcome home, that son never forgot it. I hope that you'd never forget it. Maybe there's someone here this morning that that's the message you need to hear. You need to hear a message that says you're forgiven. You need to hear words that say, welcome home. Maybe you have things in your life to address, to deal with that you've been holding on for, for far too long. Maybe like the young son, you need to just kind of come to your senses Maybe it's been pride to this point that has kept you from 
taking that step. Maybe again wondering what others would think. Wondering if you'd be accepted. Maybe you need to dismiss all those things. Just simply say it's time to make that step. It's time to, to, to get up from the, where, I'm, where I'm feeding pigs and to just throw myself at my father's feet. Confessing sin, making my life right with him. Maybe there's some who are, have not become Christians that today you're ready to make that step. And we want to help you with that. We could, we could address that this very morning. You could become a Christian by understanding what we're talking about here, repenting of sin, being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of those sins. You could experience forgiveness. Or maybe there's things in your life you need to fix. And again, you could experience forgiveness by just simply asking God. And maybe you want the help of church family to, to help hold you accountable, to, to help to encourage you, to pray for you, to lift you up. And we'd address that for you this morning. If we can help you in any way, you can come now. While we stand, while we sing this song together. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, go haste to its brink. Tis the fountain of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of back from Nebraska. We had a good trip and my grandson won a grand champion uh, of market steer overall so he was real pleased and so were we. Um, there's a cookout tonight at six o'clock. Weather's going to be nice so I hope everybody can come out. It'll be uh, on the north side of the north foyer just like the last time and all the food will be provided and so, but if you want comfortable chairs, you need to bring your own. Otherwise, you can sit in the metal chairs. Uh, a back to school bash will be held Saturday at 6 in the North Foyer. Food and drinks will be provided, and there will also be an ice cream Sunday bar. There have been questions about game night. The next one is tentatively scheduled for Friday. August the 20th. A sign-up sheet is on the bulletin board for you to indicate if you plan to attend so it can be determined if there is a sufficient interest and so if you have any additional questions you need to see Rick. 
And on August the 22nd at 5, there will be a deacons and elders meeting. And concerning the sick, Sherry Bartlett, Rita Key's sister, is in the hospital in ICU with COVID-19 and is on the BiPAP machine. Wyatt Gibbons has been diagnosed with hypothyroidism and iron deficiency and is pre-diabetic. He will be following up with an uh, endocrinologist and taking medications and vitamins. It's already pr proving a challenge as to what he and they can eat. Amanda Kirby was in the ER last week and had a stress test on Thursday. Josie Lynn continues to have health issues. She was sick last week and taken to the doctor on Thursday. She is awaiting test results. Sandra Martindale is now staying with Paige. Mary Beth Ritchie has been struggling with diverticulitis and as just about an hour, 45 minutes ago, she's on her way to Indy to the ER, so she's not doing well at all. Terry Sanders will have surgery on Friday, August the 13th at 7.30 in the morning at IU Health in Indianapolis. He will be in the hospital five to 10 days. Heather Wessel woke up on Thursday and all the tubes were removed. And I think um, she'll be re moved to a different facility in the next day or two. Former Mayor John Williams had three heart attacks on Friday and was taken to IU Health Bloomington and had three stents were put in. Beth Staley passed away about five this morning Several here knew her and she was a member in Southland. And of course we need to pray for our shut-ins and the many other family and friends on our prayer list and those of our congregation that are dealing with cancer. If you'll pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can come to you in prayer, that we can come and talk with you and tell you our concerns and what are our hearts. We ask as we come there here this morning that uh, we were glad that we were here, that we were here to worship you and that it was um, in a manner well pleasing. Uh, we praise your name and above all and we know that uh, you're the giver of uh, all our blessings and we're so thankful for the things that you give us for your love and for your son that died upon that cross. We just are so thankful. So, And we just ask that as a church here, as we gather together, that we remain faithful, that our, we will increase our faith, that we will do things that will um, do good in this community, that we will reach out, that we will touch other people's lives so that they may come and and be with us and to, to worship here. We ask that you be with uh, uh, the sick. We have several that uh, were mentioned, several in the bulletin. We have so many that uh, uh, are on our hearts and we just ask that uh, you be with them, you give them the strength they need. We ask that you um, uh, put your healing hands upon them that you know the needs of what they need, and we just ask that you um, uh, do that for them, that you will um, uh, give them what they need. Uh, we just ask that we as a congregation, that we, uh, if there's things that we can do, that we need to reach out, that we need to touch each other's lives, that we might uh, go and, and uh, uh, encourage each other, build us, each of us up. We just ask that you continue to be with us. We ask that you forgive us of our mistakes, our sins, and then we ask that you help us to forgive others as they can forgive us. We just ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.